Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, and I'd like to wish every one of you a very happy Memorial Day. I'd like to um, I'd like to thank Amy and Sam for the awesome music. Maybe before we have the opportunity to get into today's talk, we can just bow in the presence of our holy God and just give him thanks. Let's pray. Our Father, we would bow in your presence and we thank you so much for this land. Um, Lord, your word teaches us that if my people who are called by my name will, will humble themselves and if they will pray, then I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven and I will heal the land. Thank you for this land and thank you for this next 35 minutes that we have to consider your word. And I pray for an open door as we enjoy it together. For we would ask it in Jesus' name. Um, well, I want to wish you all a very happy Memorial Day. I want you to know that um, we celebrate a lot of days, a lot of different days here in the United States. There's, there's Veterans Day, that's in November, and Veterans Day would probably be the time that you go up to the vet and you just say thank you for your service. It was a time that if you were in an airport or if you're at a shopping center that you just see random strangers rushing up to vets and just saying thank you so much. Thank you so much for what you're doing so that we can enjoy the liberties and the freedom here in this beautiful country. And then there's Armed Service Day. Armed Service Day is a time when you're supposed to bake homemade goods. I'm just learning this. Homemade goods for veterans. It's a way not to so much say thank you for your service, but to show the service through cards and through delicacies and homemade treats. And then there's Patriots Day. If you lived in New England, you would have the opportunity to get the day off from school and file your income taxes a day later. If you lived in New England, you would celebrate Patriots Day as we have the chance to commemorate and remember the ending of the Great Revolutionary War. But the most sacred of all these days by far is, is Memorial Day. It's uh, a time where we have the chance to acknowledge those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for those who died so that we can enjoy great freedoms. Those who died in combat, those who died by disease, those who were killed because of various wars of our country. Now you might celebrate Memorial Day a lot of different ways. I mean, you might enjoy picnics and that's fun and parades, uh, barbecues, you might uh, enjoy shopping. All these things are really great. Um, I remember last Memorial Day when we were gathered together at Nomahegan Park, Scott Dunkerton was playing ultimate Frisbee football with the teenagers. I was a little jealous of that, I've got to admit. But Memorial Day um, ultimately started, it was known as Decoration Day. And it started after the Civil War in 1865. And you would have um, these women, it was really women who kicked it off. It was women in the North who would go to these um, cemeteries and they would decorate the tombstones. Can you imagine this? They would decorate the tombstones of their husbands and of their sons and of their uncles and of their brothers. And the April rain produced these flowers and they would decorate tombstones with flowers and with ribbon and with flags. The Civil War ended in April 1865 when General Lee surrendered to General Grant. And the terms of the surrender were that if you were a Confederate soldier, you were to lay down your guns. If you were an officer, you could hold your pistol. You could keep your mules. You could keep your horses because it was planting season. But you had to lay down your guns and you had to roll up the Confederate flag and you had to pledge allegiance to the United States of America. And if you accepted those terms, then you had the opportunity to go back to your farms. Uh, maybe you've been to Appomattox Courthouse. It's just in pretty much the middle of nowhere, buried in the heart of Virginia. So the war ended in April 9th, 1865, but there were small skirmishes that continued. There were small conflicts, there were battles that happened after this peace was produced. And it was because word had not yet reached outstretched territories and states. One of those states was Texas. It wasn't until May 12th and May 13th of 1865 that the war finally ended, that, the, that all of the small little skirmishes and battles ended. And ironically, the Confederacy won the last battle of the Civil War. I mean, you can't make this up. 
I'd invite you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, because I want you to know that the Bible teaches us that we are involved in a spiritual war. That's what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul is going to outline this, and he's going to bring this to our attention. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to Google it, and I want you to read uh, starting in verse number 3 with me. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The Apostle Paul identifies that if you know and love the Lord Jesus, that you're involved in spiritual battles. In Ephesians chapter 6, we're told that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. And he identifies those who we do wrestle with. We wrestle with principalities and rulers in heavenly places, the rulers of darkness. The Apostle John tells us, he says, that we know that we are of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. That's what the Apostle John says. That the economy lies under the sway of the wicked one. And the political system lies under the sway of the wicked one. And that the educational system lies under the sway of the wicked one. And in a way, you don't really have to go so far to see that. To see that we live in, in a world that has been corrupted by sin... And that Jesus Christ has given me life. He hasn't fixed my body yet, but he has given me eternal life. And I want you to know that uh, the big point, or the first big point of this talk this morning, is to say that although there are spiritual battles in your life, that the war is over. The war is over. Jesus Christ has abolished death. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. I don't have to be afraid about death. He's taken care of that. The last enemy. He makes that uh, mention in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The war is over. Jesus Christ has destroyed him who has power over death. That's Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus Christ has made peace with God through the blood of his cross. That's what the book of Romans teaches us. So although there are spiritual battles in our lives, and there truly are, the war is over. And I want you to have confidence, and I want you to be in love with that point this morning. That we don't have to try to figure out our way how to please God, because Christ has done that. Peace has been declared. Well, when was that? Was it when he was the baby in Bethlehem, and the, the, wise, the wise kings came and gave him those fancy gifts? Or was it when he gave the greatest moral teaching that the world had ever seen on the Sermon of the Mount? Is, is that when peace was declared? Or is it yet to be when he comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he establishes a millennial kingdom for a thousand years here upon the earth? I mean, even though all those things are fantastic, and they truly are, peace was declared at the cross. Peace was declared at the cross. When the Bible teaches us that he who knew no sin, right? There was no sin in his mind ever. And there was no sin in his heart ever. He who knew no sin, the Bible says he was made to be sin. Why? He was made to be sin for me. That I might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took my sin and he gave me his righteousness. It's incredible. It's an incredible truth that we enjoy this morning. And so you say, well, General Grant, what are your terms? Here are the terms. Roll up the flag, lay down the guns, pledge allegiance, and you can go home. So tell me, what are God's terms? What are God's terms that I can enjoy this peace so that I don't have to be afraid? You know, my friends, I want you to know in the Old Testament, when God came, the transcendent God came and spoke to the nation of Israel, the whole mountain of Sinai was alive with flames. And the people said, we don't want to talk to him. You go and talk to him. And nobody could look at him. In the Old Testament, there was one day, one day that the holiest man of God, the high priest, could go into the holiest place before God. 
And he didn't go in peacefully. He went in wearing these bells and these robes. And he went in with blood. And he would take his finger and he would dip his finger seven times onto this holy piece of furniture that Israel had. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. He was just trying to make an atonement. He wanted to get into this place. He wanted to get out as fast as he could. We don't have to do any of those things. There is no fire. There is no danger. And there is no curtain that hangs that separates me from a holy God. What are God's terms? Here are God's terms. That if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then, then the Apostle Paul teaches us that you'll be saved. That, that salvation is not based on the works of my hands. I can't earn it. It's not based on the intellect of my mind. It doesn't matter what college I went to. And it's not based on the heritage of my birth. Just because I'm born into a certain family doesn't give me that great privilege. It's based on the faith of your heart. It's based on the faith of your heart as we consider the great message of Christ and the claims that he has provided. The war's over. Right? We, we could close with a word of prayer right now. Maybe some of you at home would say, good, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad for that. You know, I, I want you to know something. When I, was, um, when I was in college, I used to go to a chapel that was very similar to this. And there were times that I would practice these talks, and I'd walk, walk into the building. There'd be nobody there. And I would just sort of stand up, and I would talk to an empty audience, all these empty pews. And once there was a cleaning lady that was there, and she heard this, and she came barreling in, and she said, this is ridiculous. You're never going to talk to an, to an empty room. <laughs> and lo and behold, here we are, talking to an empty room. But I'm, I'm confident that you're at home. And I'm confident that you're with me as we're enjoying these, these truths. The Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, the weapons of our battle, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What does that mean? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means that they're not of this world. They're not of this world. I am not going to have spiritual victory in my life with anything that's been made from this world. I'm not going to have spiritual victory because I can shoot a gun better or because I can drive a tank or I know how a flamethrower works. I'm not going to have spiritual victory because of money either. I'm not going to be able to fight those battles because somehow I can have muscles where I wish that I had muscles. The Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare or of our battles are not carnal. They're not of this world, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. For pulling down strongholds. I want to talk for a moment about strongholds. Strongholds. It grips like a vice. Strongholds don't let go. And maybe in your life you think to yourself, you know, I've got strongholds. I've got things in my life that I just live with. I just don't quite know how to get rid of. It's just sort of like you live with water in your basement and you don't know quite where to go. The Bible tells us that we're fighting with the wrong tools. We're fighting with man-made wisdom and man-made ideas. This, um, this mom came up to me this really wealthy, well-to-do mom came up to me and she said, John, your life is so complicated. I've read this book about making things simple. You've got to simplify your life. You can simplify your life in easy steps. And I just sort of stepped back. I said, okay, how about this? I can simplify my life like you. One, I could have no job. And two, I could be married to a millionaire. There, I just simplified my life and two easy steps. <clears throat> the Bible teaches us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Strongholds. Um, I want you to turn with me, if you can, uh, in the Old Testament to a great account that we have in the book of 2 Samuel and chapter 5, please. 2 Samuel and chapter 5, please. I want you to know that in the Old Testament, we read a lot about battles. There's a lot of war in the Old Testament. It's, 
It's very fascinating. If you're a student of war, and if you're a student of, of uh, all these tactics, then you would love, you would love to enjoy the Old Testament. There's a lot of battles. The Philistines fight the Amalekites, and the Syrians fight the Edomites, and everybody is fighting, it seems like, in every other chapter. But there's one nation that nobody fights, and that nation was the Jebusites. The Jebusites had this stronghold. It was in Jerusalem. There was no way you could conquer this stronghold. Nobody even tried. You would just sort of say, this isn't even worth a conversation. Nobody's going to be able to do this. In 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse number 6, this is what we read. And the king, that's King David, and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. I mean, it's the very next verse. So here are these Jebusites. Everybody leaves them alone. You don't have a prayer and a chance against them. They are dug in, they are fortified, and nobody can take Jerusalem City. It's a stronghold. It grips like a vice, and it won't let go. So we think personally about strongholds again in our lives. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's a temper. Maybe you just say, look, I... Um, I can control so many pieces of machinery and I can control so many, so many large objects, but I just can't control my tongue and I just can't control my temper. I just don't know how it, to do it. I don't know how it works. Or maybe the stronghold is lust. That's something that men don't really talk about. It's sort of like something that is so private and yet so deep and yet there's so many men that are just enchained to it. Awful. Or maybe that stronghold is loving money. And you just sort of have to, uh, to express to everybody and show everybody all of the materialism and all of the possessions because somehow or another, if you can just get your office, three offices above mine, that, that is going to bring some kind of peace of mind and you have really arrived. Or maybe that stronghold is worry, that all you do is just obsess. I went to a workshop that said that we have over 50,000 50, thoughts in the same day. 50,000 thoughts flash through your mind in the same day. 90% of those thoughts are the same thing. That all I do is just obsess about my kids, and I obsess about my, my things, and I obsess about what could happen. I obsess about tomorrow. There's just a lot of worry. Or maybe, maybe that stronghold for you is pride. That somehow or another you're better than everybody else. And, and uh, this is where you were accepted. And this is, what is the stronghold? The stronghold that when you're quiet and you're still at night, you know that you're, you're not going to have victory over this. Because you can't fight this stronghold with, with the means that the world has provided. It doesn't matter what People Magazine says and how to get rid of your temper. It doesn't work. These things are just too hard. I just don't have the power. There's no victory here. There's no victory, and it's terribly discouraging. Do you notice even in this lovely example that we identified, the Jebusites said to King David and to his men, come on in here. Even if we put blind men on the wall and lame men on the wall, you're not going to be able to take us. I mean, you got nothing. And the soldiers, they said that to King David. You can't win. The frustration and the discouragement and the defeat. Friends, that's a playbook right from Satan. It's right from the pit of hell. You're never going to overcome that addiction, right? That's right from the playbook of Satan. It doesn't matter. You're never going to reconcile with your son. It's just too deep. It's too damaging. You've gone too far. You're never going to find peace in your life. It's never going to happen for you. I want you to just look in your Bible at verse number 7. The very first word is nevertheless. You see that? 
God gave David a nevertheless. All of the things you're telling me, nevertheless, the phrase is David takes the stronghold of Zion. It's the very next verse. And I, I, I want you to know that without a doubt in my mind that God has written into your chapter of your life the word nevertheless. He's given you a nevertheless. So yes, I'm born into an alcoholic family. Nevertheless, I can live a sober life in Christ. Yes, I grew up with a brutal father. But nevertheless, I can be a good and godly parent because the Spirit of God dwells inside of me. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. This isn't new world thinking. It's not to simplify your life. It's not, it's not um, mindfulness. I mean, I'm not against those things, right? I, I, I want to put a disclaimer out there. I'm not, I, I'm not against mindfulness. I'm just not sure how effective it is to fight spiritual battles. So the thought is, okay, the weapons of this warfare uh, of, the, of the world are carnal. Okay, well, what is mighty in God? What is the weapon that God gives to me to have victory? Well, the, the Bible tells us that it's the sword of the Spirit. It's the sword of the Spirit. And I want you to notice that the sword of the Spirit is not your sword. That's the first thing. It's the sword of the Spirit. And as I have the opportunity to read God's Word, and you know what, I'm not a very big reader, so I'll rephrase that. As I have the opportunity to listen to God's Word, I have the opportunity to enjoy the promises that are mentioned in God's Word. I have the opportunity to enjoy the Redeemer that is provided in God's Word. I have the opportunity to see the... The, the, the production that God can do in me. And I take confidence and, and, and my confidence starts to grow because of the fact that I serve a risen Savior and that he's in this world today. Amen. And I want you to know that the angels don't sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Why not? Because it's not their song. It's my song. And if you know and love the Lord, it's your song. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Now, I want you to know I hate... Uh, I'm not a big fan of museums. I don't know. I just walk around museums, and they're, they're just exhausting. I just don't know quite how else to say it. We bring kids to museums on class trips. I go right to the gift shop. And then from the gift shop, I get a coffee. You know, and sometimes I just hang out with the bus driver. I, I hope you don't think I'm too shallow. As far as museums are concerned, I was, I was visiting this museum, and it was in Virginia, and it had these beautiful swords, and they hung from the ceiling. These swords were double, with double handles, and they, they had these tassels hanging from the handles. They were historically interesting, even to me, but they were practically useless. You would never use the sword today in battle. Historically interesting, sure. Practically useless, probably, yes. There are so many believers in Christ. I, I could put myself into that category as well. I'm sharing this to my own heart as well. There are so many of us that take that same view as far as spiritual victories also. That my Bible, though it might be historically interesting, John, it's practically useless. And so it can just sit, and days go on, and I scurry around to try to put out fires and to try to fight different things when I know that ultimately, I know that ultimately, the victory comes through the Spirit of God, and the victory comes in me yielding myself and surrendering as it was, giving my sword over and saying, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And I don't want to be burdened by these things anymore. So I want to encourage you to pick up your Bibles. Or in my case, I want you to, I want you to be encouraged to read your Bibles. I want to just um, close with one thought. 
on this Memorial Day, and it's found in 1 Timothy and chapter 1. And I will tell you that this is, um, I think this is my favorite passage in God's Word, and I think I go to this passage more than any other one. It helps me. And, and during difficult times or struggling times, I find great comfort in this. I love this passage, and I want you to love it too. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says in verse 2, he writes to Timothy, he says to Timothy, my true son in the faith. The Apostle Paul is writing to his son. He's writing to his son. I have three sons. If I was going to write a letter to my son, or if I was going to have a conversation with my son about things that really matter, right? I mean, you have a conversation about all these different things and, and the TV shows and the ball games, and, and this is all wonderful. But if I was going to share with them some things that really mattered about their dad, what would some of those things be? The Apostle Paul is going to write to his son. It's not his biological son. And this young man's name was Timothy. And Timothy was a leader of the church at Ephesus, and Timothy was struggling. He just was. And the Apostle Paul wrote this, and he shared this out with Timothy. And he says this in verse 12. He says, I thank, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. You know, if you're a dad and you're listening to this and you were going to write a letter or you were going to share something intimate with your daughter or with your son, what would it be? You know, would you take them around to the ballpark where you used to play when you were a kid? Would you have the opportunity to boast about your report card and you can compare notes to what their report card is? Would you be able to tell them that this was the, the big move as far as your advancement at the company or, or, or this was how far I hit the ball back in the day? I mean, if you were going to share something with your son or your daughter, it, it would... By far, it would be something you could boast about. The Apostle Paul had an arsenal of things he could have boasted about. He could have told Timothy that he was caught up in the third heaven. He could have told Timothy that he was left for dead at Lystra, which, by the way, was Timothy's hometown. He could have told Timothy that he was beaten, beaten with rods and that he was shipwrecked a day and the night, three days and the night in the sea. He could have told Timothy that, that um, he... he, he was in difficulty in journeys all the time. He just was in prisons, all the rest of it. He doesn't do that. What does he tell Timothy? He says, Tim Timothy, I want you to know that I was a blasphemer and I was a persecutor and I was a violent man. I want you to know that. Timothy, I don't want you to be so moved because of your past that God can't forgive and God can't remove and God can't sustain. I want you to know, Timothy, he says, I was a violent man. Imagine if you were going to work at the Kenilworth Chapel Preschool and you filled out the application and the application said, tell us three things about yourself. And you said, well, I'm a, I'm a blasphemer and I'm a violent person and I've had a rough past. <laughs> he said, that would that'd be it for you. <laughs> but Paul does that. And then he says this, but God's grace is greater than my past. See, one of the strongholds that holds me back is past. And that's why I go to this passage, because it's very comforting to me that God's grace is greater than my past. That God's grace can forgive my past. That God's grace has washed away my past. And that God wants to redeem my past for his name's sake and for his glory. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. And then the apostle brings this forward right to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I want this straight just for the record. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And just in case anybody's keeping score, I'm the chief, or I was the worst of all of the sinners. 
So friends, I'm, 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 I'm talking to you on this Memorial Day, and I know that we've covered a lot of different ground. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, to have the chance to, to think about the weapons, the weapons that we use in our daily battles. I want you to know that you can pull down strongholds with the power of God. I want you to know that the war is over, that Christ has won it, that I don't have to work my way to heaven, and that the best is truly yet to come. And I want you to know that we have the opportunity in this next week to serve, to serve the Savior and to be the ambassador here while he tarries in heaven. So I do, I do hope that you have a wonderful Memorial Day, and I do hope that you have the opportunity to spend it with your family and perhaps your friends and I am thankful for this land, and I just pray God's richest blessing. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that we are told that your grace is greater than our past, and that your grace is greater than any stronghold that holds us back. We think about different people and that we know and love who struggle with so many different addictions and so many different things. And Lord, we would just pray that we would acknowledge that we need help from you and that we need help from your word and that we would listen to the counsel and the advice that's given to you. Thank you, Lord, that you have not given up on us. Thank you, Lord, that you have written the word nevertheless into our portion as well. And we would be careful to give you all the praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.